Inspector Professor Rajamohan Gandhi, Professor Akere Tamarishnan, Dr. Joy Ulaman, dear friends, good evening and welcome. I am Dimri Divakaran, Director General, Institute of Parliamentary Affairs. Mahatma Gandhi Lecture is part of Gandhi Jayanti celebrations organized by Institute of Parliamentary Affairs. Professor Rajamohan Gandhi will speak on the topic nation building and reconciliation, the South Asian experience. Professor Rajamohan Gandhi does not need any introduction, but as a custom, let me say a few words. Professor Gandhi is an academician, historian, author, biographer, former editor of Indian Express, former Rajya Sabha member, and an activist. He currently serves as research professor in the College of Education at the University of Illinois. He has been teaching at the University of Illinois since 1997. He is also a scholar in residence at Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhi Nagar. Professor Gandhi is a prolific writer who wrote more than a dozen books. The latest publication is Modern South India, a history from the 17th century to our times. Professor Gandhi received a Sahitya Academy Award in 2002 for his book Rajaji, A Life, a Biography of Chakravarti Rajava Balajari. And he also received the annual award from Indian History Congress in 2007 for his book Mohandas, A True Story of a Man, His People and an Empire. Professor Rajamohan Gandhi has been engaged in efforts for trust building, reconciliation, democracy, and in battles against corruption and inequalities for many decades. It is an absolute honor for me to welcome Professor Rajamohan Gandhi to this program. Welcome, sir. The lecture will be chaired by Professor A.K. Ramakrishnan. Professor Ramakrishnan teaches at the Center for West Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He was previously been distinguished international scholar and visiting professor at Bethnal University, USA. He also served as a professor of West Asian Studies, Jamia Bilia Islamia, and was a director of the School of International Relations and Politics at Mahatma Gandhi University, Kota. Professor Damoshtan is an expert in international relations theory, West Asian affairs, gender, and post-colonial studies. Welcome, Professor Damoshtan. Institute is organizing this program in association with Kerala Institute of Local Administration. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Joy Ullaman, Director General, and Matthew Andrews, Assistant Director of Kila, and many others. Many students, teachers, and scholars are participating in this program. Welcome, friends. Professor Gandhi will respond to a few questions after the lecture. Please test your questions in the chat box. Thank you. To A.K. Ramakrishna. Thank you, Dr. Dimpi Dibhaganan. Uh, it's, uh, it's great pleasure, actually, to, to be with you, uh, to listen to Professor Rajmohan Gandhi, uh, who is well known as a journalist, as, a, as an academic, as a writer. Um, uh, I won't stand between you and uh, uh, Professor Gandhi, um, uh, we will straight away go to his lecture uh, and we will have some time for discussion there. Uh, if need be, I will also chip in. Uh, my job here is to, to call on uh, Rajmohan Gandhi to, to deliver his lecture on reconciliation and nation building, the South Asian experience. It's over to you, uh, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan. I hope I'm being heard. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Devakaran, for your kind words. I give my greetings and my regards to everyone who has joined this uh, interaction. So uh, I will start with some historical questions and then move to more recent matters. At least from the Indian and Pakistani points of view, the India-Pakistan relationship lies at the heart of the story of South Asia, a region which also, of course, includes Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, the Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. 
Contrary to what many may think, the 1947 partition was not a division of the then British run undivided India along religious lines. Neither the British Parliament's Independence Act of 1947, which came into force on July 18, 1947, nor the famous June 3, 1947 agreement between Viceroy Mountbatten and the leaders of the Congress, the Muslim League and the Akali Party, stated directly or indirectly that India was being divided into two homelands, one Hindu and the other Muslim. The subcontinent's Muslim majority areas were indeed grouped together and given the right to form a separate country. But it was not claimed by any signatory to the June 3 agreement or by the act of July 18 in London that British India was to be split between Hindu and Muslim nations or Hindu and Muslim homelands. India's leaders at the time underlined again and again that their acceptance of the partition plan did not mean acceptance of the two-nation theory, which they continued to reject. Partition was accepted with sadness and by some with a naive hope that it would prove temporary. The two-nation theory, however, was rejected. Jinnah's well-known speech of August 11, 1947, made before Pakistan's first legislature and constituent assembly, also insisted that while Pakistan possessed a, possessed a Muslim majority, it was a land for everyone, a country where people were free to practice any faith. Before long, however, Pakistani politicians demanded that their new nation should become an Islamic state. Jinnah died 13 months after Pakistan's emergence, and while some of Pakistan's leaders continued to resist the notion of a Muslim Rashtra of Pakistan, that notion gained growing acceptance and was eventually enshrined in Pakistan's constitution. In India, the story was entirely different. Despite the carnage and migrations of 1947, migrations and a carnage that affected with an amazing parity, Muslims on one side, non-Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs on the other side, despite that carnage and the migrations, the leaders of India, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, Deputy Prime Minister Vallabhai Patel and their counselor, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi were clear, newly independent India would be an India for all with equal rights and protections for everyone in it. While remembering and recording this fact, we should also recognize that that fact was a feat in the toxic climate of the second half of 1947 for the leaders of India to remain firm in launching the new nation as a nation for all equally was an achievement, as significant maybe, as India's success in gaining independence. Moreover, and this was equally noteworthy, in successive elections, the people of India unambiguously supported their country's journey as a nation for all. A milestone almost as important as August 15, 1947, is November 26, 49 when our constitution was adopted. Given the brutal reality of what in 1949 was still a recent carnage of 47, the wholeheartedness with which our constitution confirmed what Gandhi, Nehru and Patel had insisted upon, namely an Indian nation for all equally, irrespective of anyone's religion, evokes admiration in our times. The creators of our constitution were aware that Indian society needed a legal and political system that fostered equality and harmony. Although many of its members had landed in the Constituent Assembly almost straight from prison, they were detached enough while preparing the constitution not to inject prejudice into the text. Interestingly, the equality they wrote into the constitution was as much between races as it was in respect of different castes, genders, classes, or creeds. They were perfectly willing in appropriate cases to see someone called white, black, mongoloid, or anything else as Indian. Article 15.1 says categorically, the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, 
place of birth or any of them. And in Article 14, the phrase, any person, is not qualified by any restriction of any kind whatsoever. It says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Setting the tone for the constitution, the preamble commits India to, quote, justice, social, economic, and political, unquote, apart from invoking liberty, equality, and fraternity. The battle for justice between unequal persons and groups was high on the minds of members. For many of them, social justice was as central a goal as national independence. While some had campaigned for social justice with passion, others had seen virtues in a traditional social order. Reluctantly or enthusiastically, all agreed that tradition would yield to justice in our constitution. Now in August of this year, just two months ago, that courageous campaigner for justice for India's targeted vulnerable sections, Mr. Harsh Mandar, wrote about the significance of the word fraternity in the preamble. Reading his article just two months ago, I tried to probe the story behind the inclusion of the word fraternity in the preamble. As is well known, the Constituent Assembly's deliberations on the constitution were based on a draft constitution, which was prepared by a drafting committee, which was chaired by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. A series of volumes entitled The Framing of India's Constitution Select Documents, edited by B. Shivara, it's available online, contains information about the drafting committee's work. Page 484 of volume three of this series shows the word fraternity in the draft preamble for the first time while providing minutes of the drafting committee's meeting of February 6, 1948. This date suggests that the inclusion of fraternity may have been connected to the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, which had occurred a week earlier. Such an inference is strengthened by a letter to Dr. Ambedkar, writing as the drafting committee's chairman, addressed on February 21, 1948, to Babu Rajendra Prasad, president of the Constituent Assembly. In this letter, which can be seen on page 510 of volume three of this series, Ambedkar said, quote, the drafting committee has added a clause about fraternity in the preamble, although it does not occur in the objectives resolution. He continues, the committee felt that the need for fraternal concord and goodwill in India was never greater than now, and that this particular aim of the new constitution should be emphasized by special mention in the preamble, unquote. As consequential as the preamble and the fundamental rights guaranteed by a constitution, was the partnership involving Ambedkar, Nehru, Patel, Gandhi, and others that was crucial to the emergence of the constitution. How that partnership occurred is a story I have told elsewhere. Here, what I want to recall, is the, is, the, is the illuminating lesson in reconciliation and, re and nation building which that partnership offers. As a consequence of that partnership, a brilliant and passionate human being who happened also to be an Indian, who happened also to be a Dalit, piloted a, con piloted a constitution assuring equal rights to all in a society that for centuries had called people like him inferior and untouchable and had treated them harshly at an elected constituent assembly where a large majority were caste Hindus, welcomed and adopted such a constitution. When to this partnership, we add the text of the constitution, including its declaration that untouchability is abolished and that its practice would be a punishable crime, plus the articles that pledge equality irrespective of caste, we, we visual we visualize what may indeed be called a giant step towards reconciliation and nation building. We can visualize this even while we recognize as we must the gap, the shameful gap between the constitution and what obtains on the ground. Now for building a house, it's perhaps best to start with the floor, preferably the basement 
not with the water tank on top of the roof or the flag, flag pole on top of the roof, even if you wish to raise a wonderful flag after the house has been built. This truth has been well remembered. That, sorry, this truth has not been well remembered in the construction of the nations of South Asia. Pakistan ensured the loss of Bangladesh when soon after its creation, it declared that its national and official language would be Urdu, which was barely understood by the Bengalis who comprised the country's majority and who lived more than 3,000 kilometers away from West Pakistan, where many Punjabis, Hindis, Pakhtuns, and Balochis did understand Urdu, even though it was not their mother tongue. In Sri Lanka, the country's leading Tamil party some decades, some decades back was the federal party, which asked only for a federal Sri Lanka, of which the Tamils would be a willing part. Rejecting federalism seemingly out of hand, the, the leadership of Sri Lanka contributed to the prolonged civil war that has ravaged the beautiful island southeast of Kerala. In India, we are constantly reminded of shortcomings in the working of our federal system by events in Kashmir in the north, or in Punjab in the west, or in Assam, Manipur, Nagaland, Meghalaya, and Mizoram in the east. As for the states in South India, we cannot be surprised by their stout refusal to accept a relegation of their languages or assaults on their autonomy. The unity of a society, a country, a region is painstakingly built. You cannot, you cannot force a nation into existence or force it into stability after it has been built. What keeps a family together is concern for one another, respect for one another, and listening to one another. The same may be true for the togetherness of a nation. A nation dominated by people belonging to one region or one language or one religion or one caste or one cluster of castes will alternate between unrest and silence, depending on the strength at any time of the dominating segment. And domination will have consequences. Some words on India's Northeast. The racial and cultural richness which the Northeast brings to the rest of India is obvious. However, the area possesses a great collection of wonderful peoples who have not yet become one people among themselves or with Indians elsewhere. The movement of people over the decades within and into the beautiful, mountainous, green, and relatively sparsely populated region of the Northeast has been a major factor in the region's history. Joined to the rest of India by a narrow corridor to the south of Nepal and Bhutan, and to the north and west of Bangladesh, the Northeast is home to around 45 million people from over 250 indigenous communities who speak more than 400 languages and dialects, and who belong to several faiths, including numerous indigenous faiths. Along with British rule, which came to the Northeast <coughs> much after India's North, Middle, and South was conquered. Along with British rule came from Bengal, government employees, teachers, lawyers, railway workers, and other professionals. Farmers from what would later become Bangladesh moved into the river valleys of the Northeast. Nepalese entered the Northeast in substantial numbers. Tea garden workers also in large numbers moved to the Northeast from central India. During and after the India-Pakistan War of 1971, followed by the creation of Bangladesh, many Bangladeshis, Muslim and Hindu Bangla speakers, moved into various parts of Assam. Incidentally, Assam contains 74% of the Northeast population, Tripura contains 7.6%, and other states in the Northeast contain the rest. Facing population movements at a pace not witnessed by other regions of India, the varied groups of the Northeast have sought comfort and security in their particular ethnic tent, but clashes have followed. The area's topography also made cultural, social, and political intermingling harder. Mutual acceptance of one another has not occurred to a sufficient degree. 
Now, the long and well-known agitation in Assam for identifying foreigners reached an uncomfortable milestone 14 months ago when 1.9 million individuals were listed as lacking evidence of Indian nationality. This large number included Bangla-speaking Muslims, Bangla-speaking Hindus, and numerous others of Assamese or Northeast origin. The future of these 1.9 million people remains unclear and uncertain, and it may turn out to be harrowing. When, after this exercise in Assam to create the National Register of Citizens, or NRC, when more Muslims were not found to be foreigners, and many Hindus were found not to be Indian nationals, there was resentment. This resentment was part of the push behind the deeply troubling Citizenship Amendment Act, which was passed on December 12, 2019. For the first time in the history of Free India, religion was made a criterion for citizenship or potential citizenship. During the discussion in Parliament on this act, Home Minister Amit Shah announced that a nationwide NRC would be compiled. Because of Assam's unique history and situation, an NRC there had been widely viewed as an unavoidable but necessary burden. But the prospect of everyone in the land needing to prove with papers their citizenship was felt to be too much. Speeches by Mr. Shah and others in the ruling party suggested that a search for illegal Muslim Bangladeshis in Assam was turning into a demand for Muslims across India to, to prove their citizenship. Nationwide protests were triggered that continued to swell until the COVID pandemic made public demonstrations impossible. Concerns were not allayed when Mr. Shah declared that all of India would be involved, if not in an NRC, then in an NPR, a national population register, which seemed capable of creating a category of doubtful citizens. Now, around 90 years ago, in 1931, well before independence, principles for a free Indian nation of the future were formulated. This was when the Indian National Congress met in Karachi under the presidentship of Patel. At that time, patriots of all political persuasions, I'm speaking of 1931, at that time, patriots of all political persuasions, including persons like A.K. Gopalan and E.M.S. Nambudripad, were members of the Indian National Congress. Close collaboration between Nehru and Gandhi produced the text of this 1931 resolution, which was moved by Gandhi in Karachi. This is what he said at the time, quote, by passing this resolution, we make it clear to the world and to our own people what we propose to do as we come into power, unquote. This resolution committed the Congress and it committed the independence movement to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, freedom of assembly. It committed the independence movement to equality regardless of caste, sex, or creed. It committed the independence movement to a secular state. It committed the independence movement to the abolition of untouchability and serfdom. Firmly nailed into the constitution, architected by Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, and enacted on November 26, 1949, these principles have defined the Indian state and the Indian nation for 70 years. Thanks to these principles, our country found cohesion within and prestige abroad. Making light of these principles or to think of abandoning them or looking away when these principles are violated is the road to unhappiness, shame, and worse. Now on August 5 of last year, by presidential order, Articles 370 and 35A of the Constitution were in effect done away with. Kashmir's special status in the Indian Union was abolished, as was the right of the legislature of Kashmir to define permanent residents of the state and provide them with special rights, including the right to own property. Four days later, on August 9, it was reported in New York, where I am at the moment, in the United States where I'm at the moment, 
that an American legislator, a man called Tom Suozzi, a Democrat, representing New York's prosperous third district, uh, which is on the edge of the city of New York and which includes much of Northern Long Island, that this man, this legislator, had written a letter to US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo saying that the Indian government's decision on Kashmir risked, quote, provoking mass social unrest, unquote. That same day, March, uh, sorry, that same day, August 9, uh, which was a Sunday, 100 Indian Americans from the constituency of this man, Tom Suozzi, who had evidently supported him, met the legislator in his home and expressed their unhappiness. Thereafter, Tom Suozzi issued the following statement. He said, quote, based upon my meeting with the, my cons Indian American constituents, it is clear that it was a mistake not to consult with some of my Indian American friends and supporters before I sent the letter. I should have consulted them, I'm sorry. If I'd met them before sending the letter, I would have framed my concerns differently." Unquote. Now this story provided a picture of impressive interaction between a legislator and his constituents, but I was struck by something else. If Suozzi's Indian American constituents had a right to be consulted by their legislator before he wrote a letter, did the people of Kashmir have no right to be consulted before their status was changed and before their rights were taken away? Not a single Kashmiri, no legislator, no officer, constituent, voter, supporter, shawl maker, carpenter, boatman, woman or child was consulted before the takeover of August 5, 2019. I'm not speaking of the arrests that followed or the bans and curbs on the internet that continue to this day and continue, continue to hurt the health and education of Kashmiri children. For now, I want us only to reflect on how the Indian government made its August 5, 2019 decision involving the Kashmiri people. Even when the British Empire, during our rule by them, even when the British Empire made sudden and critical decisions like, for instance, arresting Gandhi and the working committee very early in the morning, at least a few Indian officials were consulted beforehand. The August 5, 2019 move over Kashmir was entirely different. Then there was August 5 this year, the date for the grand kickoff for a magnificent temple in Ayodhya. This was followed on October 1 by the decision of a CBI court to acquit all 32 individuals charged with a role in the 1992 demolition of the Babri Mosque. All evidence of calls for demolition, including videos and press reports, all this evidence was dismissed. As Arundhati Roy has put it, quote, it appears that nobody demolished the Babri Masjid, at least not legally. Perhaps the mosque demolished itself, unquote. This mysterious, indeed miraculous disappearance of the Babri Masjid on December 6, 1992, was the perfect sequence to a magical appearance on another December night. This was in 1949. As December 22 in 1949 dissolved itself that year into December 23, Idols of Rama and Sita manifested themselves inside the masjid. That was the story spread just after the idols were surreptitiously inserted in the dark of the night into the mosque. Last November, about a year ago, the Supreme Court confirmed what everyone knew in 1949 and what everyone knew in 1992 and what many had recorded. The stealthy deed of 1949 and the open destruction of 1992. No matter, the magnificent temple will come up. However, it will rest on the shaky foundation of two manufactured beliefs. The divinely ordained spontaneous manifestation of the idols and the equally fabulous vanishing act of the mosque. 
to look to the temple for reconciliation or nation building, or to imagine that commemorating August 5 in the way August 15 is remembered, to think that this will strengthen national morale is to be, how shall I put it, over optimistic. The two words South Asia invite formidable thoughts, reconciliation between India and Pakistan, between India and Nepal, between Sinhala and Tamil and Sri Lanka, reconciliation within Afghanistan, which has not had a day of peace for God knows how many years, reconciliation between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Some may remember that when Pakistan was created in 1947, Afghanistan was the only country to oppose the admission of Pakistan in the United Nations. These are daunting, uh, challenges. If we are seekers of reconciliation and if we are lovers of the nation, what should we do? What should we do when untruths and half-truths are proclaimed from positions of authority? When WhatsApp groups and TV channels incite hatred? When helpless girls are raped and their lives are extinguished by bullies who possess influence, weapons, and land? When to the applause of, every, of others present in the train compartment, a boy is stabbed and thrown out to die because his cap revealed his community? When because of their beliefs, respected intellectuals and elderly human rights activists are dragged from their homes and thrown into prison? And when, while all these things happen, those with the right to speak to the nation remain silent. What should we do? I don't know, and I can't tell you. I know of no clear roadmap that gets us out of this. But this I know. Eventually, the arc of history bends towards justice. Here is what Gandhi said, quote, truth is greater than the sun, it will shine. Unquote. Yes, truth will shine in the end. It will expose and defeat the strongest forces of domination and coercion. It will defeat the most rampant flood of untruths and half-truths. As to when this might happen, God alone knows. But I can tell you this about the United States though, as of now, and I underline as of now today, uh, the forces of domination and hierarchy are likely to lose on the 3rd of November. Meanwhile, in, in, in India too, if we look around, if we look around, we can daily find some assurance, be it ever so small, some encouragement, even occasionally some inspiration. We may find this at, time, at times even in a debate on the floor of a legislature, or we may find it from a stirring human story, portrayed on a stage, screen, or, or we can find it from a real recent story, like for instance, the story of Arif Khan, the Dalit, sorry, I beg your pardon, Arif Khan, the Delhi, the Delhi ambulance driver, who, is, who was working with the Shaheed Bhagat Singh Sevadal, this man, this driver, ambulance driver, who transported hundreds of COVID patients to hospitals, who took bodies of, of COVID patients to funeral grounds, frequently pulling out money from his meager personal wallet to assist helpless victims or their relatives. This Arif Khan driver contracted the virus and died on October 10, two days ago at the age of 48, Evidently, his children are in desperate straits now. Dear dead Arif Khan, you felt, the pain, you felt the pain of fellow human beings, and at critical moments, you reduced that pain. You were an amazing nation builder. You were an amazing reconciler. You're a hero. You've given us hope at a difficult time. There are other heroes, many other heroes. We are all aware of them in our areas, Most, mostly unknown. But all of us were uplifted two months ago in August when Prashant Bhushan submitted these words to the Supreme Court. I will read them to you, although some of you are familiar with them. We are living through, quote, we are living through that moment in our history 
when higher principles must trump routine obligations, when saving the constitutional order must come before personal and professional niceties. He continued, my tweets were nothing but a small attempt to discharge what I considered to be my highest duty at this juncture in the history of our Republic. I did not tweet in a fit of absent-mindedness. It would be insincere on my part to offer an apology for the tweets that expressed what was and continues to be my bona fide belief. He continued, therefore I can only humbly paraphrase what the father of the nation Mahatma Gandhi had said in his trial, quote, I do not ask for mercy. I do not appeal to magnanimity. I am here therefore to cheerfully submit to any penalty that can lawfully be inflicted upon me for what the court has determined to be an offense and what appears to me to be the highest duty of a citizen, unquote. Now the New York Times wrote a story of this and the heading of the, of the New York Times story was, quote, a lawyer's tweets put India's Supreme Court on trial, unquote. I must now conclude. Nation building is most meaningful at ground level. Know your neighbor, see your neighbor, listen to your neighbor, love your neighbor. These steps may be as important as any other steps. In India, our love of bloodlines, our preoccupation with our group, our caste, has kept us from learning about fellow Indians. Every now and then a great artist emerges who pulls down the barriers. But each of us, each of us can become more curious than we are. We can listen to or read about people and groups about whom we have opinions, but about whom we have no knowledge. If we are interested in the survival or strengthening of our democracy, one simple rule may help. Since the pro-democracy camp has people of all kinds and people with all kinds of history, we can decide to become, to be a little nicer to one another in the democracy camp, no matter our differences. What about the other camp? While remaining uncompromisingly opposed to domination and coercion, let us acknowledge the humanity that exists or existed or may reappear in those who inhabit the other camp. Such acknowledgement might help us to win over some of them. It would help us also in remaining firm in our opposition to domination and coercion. In the very end, I offer my love and my respects to the people of Kerala. What I've managed to learn about Kerala is so much less than what every Malayali knows by instinct and by his or her circumstances. Still, I am aware of Kerala's resilience over floods, over disease. I'm aware of Kerala's unique history, which has been shaped by Kerala's unique geography. I'm aware of Kerala's remarkably successful mix of religions. Always part of India, you in Kerala have al also always been part of the world, more so perhaps than other parts of India. May your people living on your beautiful surface lead in reconciliation, nation building and democracy building in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, inspiring speech. What can I add to that? Uh, uh, I'll just initiate some discussion with your permission. Um, I think you have uh, talked about the requirement to, to be more uh, humane in our conduct of uh, everyday life so that we can imagine a political life which is more meaningful, which is based on justice and truth. Um, but the forces that are against us are uh, 
uh, powerhouses. But uh, you should speak true power. And uh, I think your speech is, uh, in a way, doing that uh, in the most efficient manner. Uh, you have touched upon how this um, uh, nation building process in South Asia in general, but in India in particular, how that process is uh, you know, under severe stress because of uh, the undermining of uh, federal principles, because of the undermining of uh, uh, religious um, coherence between peoples, the, the suppression of democratic rights of people you have uh, brought into the questions of Kashmir, of the Northeast, and also very importantly about how uh, you know, people's own feelings were affected by what is done in 49 and 92 in, in the case of uh, the Babri Masjid, and how the judicial system is uh, now under trial, as you have mentioned, with Prashant Bhushan's case and the Babri Masjid case and, and so on and so forth. Um, the question of fraternity, how it became part of our constitutional principles that uh, Ambedkar's and Gandhi's legacy within that um, and, and the great uh, uh, you know, division between people's own lived experiences of fraternity and reconciliation, how that and how the powers that be treats uh, its own citizens. That gap is, is huge now. Uh, so the very idea of citizenship on the basis of give and take is under question. And, um, you know, the uh, Citizens Amendment Act, Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, and citizenship issues in Assam, which you have raised, all this, uh, you know, take away from us uh, our own citizenship in, in such a manner that, that uh, you know, uh, as if the state has the authority to determine uh, the citizenship of people, we people give our constitution to ourselves. Um, the state is somebody who has to keep that promise, but uh, the present day state is uh, going far away from uh, that responsibility and making the citizens uh, pay for asking for the uh, rights they deserve, the dignity they deserve. Therefore, that, that huge political flux in which we are now placed that's being brought out by your lecture, and you find solace and hope in, uh, in people's individual endeavors like the taxi driver you have mentioned, or in collective responses from various sections of people. Thank you very much for the lecture, and uh, I'm very glad to open this lecture for further uh, questions and comments from the, uh, the people who have gathered here on, online. So there's one question on, uh, you, it says that you mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, national experiences of South Asia uh, uh, and how nationalism is in a way, uh, you know, functioning as, as a kind of, uh, um, you know, destabilizing uh, experience. Um, what is your take on that? While, by the way, while listening to your remarkable summary of my talk, I was very grateful for your summary of uh, what I had said. And uh, I'm also looking at, at the questions in the, in the chats. Uh, you know, what I'm particularly glad about is that so many students are also listening in and taking part. I'm absolutely delighted about that. Um, you know, the, the points that are being raised, you know, about future of India-Pakistan relations are very tough questions. Uh, there, are, there are no simple or quick answers to such questions. So above all, 
when we realize the kind of situation we face, by the way, which is also faced by many other countries, we are not the only country that is facing this. There is this, you know, this word ethno-nationalism is a good word that is used. Uh, it seems to be something happening in many countries. Nationalism is one thing, but ethno-nationalism means that one group in a nation has the right to speak about the nation. That the whites in America should take their country back, that the Hindus of India should take India back. But India belongs to everybody, America belongs to everybody. But this ethno-nationalism is very strong in many countries. And there, as I said, there are no easy, easy ways out. But you don't know, I mean, supposing, as I'd said, that it looks today that uh, uh, Trump may be defeated on November 3, although much may happen between now and then. If that happens, perhaps that would give some encouragement to democratic forces all over the world. Uh, how, how the situation, but I think the point to remember, which I try to emphasize, is that ultimately uh, undemocratic and, and dominating and coercive forces do get defeated. It's not, that is history's lesson. That is history's lesson. Uh, history does not tell us how much time it will take in a particular country. But I think we must keep that lesson absolutely firmly in our minds and our hearts and go forward with that absolutely deep conviction. And then we have to figure out how to build alliances at the neighborhood level, at a state level, at the national level. And to repeat the point I made, those of us who are pro-democracy who are for equality, for liberty of speech, and for protection of all. We may have had many differences political, but we must now be nicer to each other and not remember, you said this last time, you did that last time. So we can practice this reconciliation in our own circles of democracy, and then maybe it will spread more widely across, across India. Yes, the Rohingya refugee issue has been mentioned, a very important one, the statelessness. I mean, so many very crucial points I see in the chat, chat box. But if there are there any particular- on, There is one the, on collective resistance also. Yes. So uh, if there are any particular, uh, do you see any possibility of collective resistance in the near future? Yeah. Uh, of course, ultimately, if, if I believe that ultimately this thing will end, uh, there will be a collective uh, dislike of it or collective uh, opposition to it, which will also help to bring about the end. But you know, in today's situation, uh, when anybody who dissents is liable to be arrested, <laughs> uh, uh, so it's not so easy to organize what might be called nationwide collective resistance. Uh, so there, to repeat, there is no roadmap. We don't know quite how to go about it. Uh, but step by step, uh, you know, again, to repeat Gandhi, after all, this is supposed to be a Gandhi lecture. One of Gandhi's favorite lines was, I do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me. One, the next step, if, you know, during the COVID times, you all learn to live one day at a time, one day at a time. So similarly, one step at a time towards uh, a collective uh, opposition to what is happening. But it will, I, I mean, I, I love it when people think of collective resistance, but, I, but there is no magical or easy formula for creating. There was one on your, uh, your take on current political leaders. <laughs> yeah, you are, I, I, I think uh, we must all get together. That's it. No, uh, I, there's no, you know, uh, yes, it's very important to, to do two things, I feel, for all of us at this time. Which is, one, we should not pin our faith on X or Y. Somebody will come and it will not happen that way. 
we are doing things. Similarly, we should not blame why is X not doing more? If only X do, does this, if only Y does this. Too bad X only does this, but he doesn't go beyond this. Well, thank God he does goes, gets up to this point. <laughs> I, I, I think so. Uh, uh, a little more appreciation of those who are, as I said, let's be nicer to those who are on the same side. That's all. Let's be more charitable. Mm -hmm. There are important questions. One is on Gandhi Ambedkar debate. Is it antagonistic? Yeah. Well, if you pick up some sentence from Gandhi and some sentences from Ambedkar, yes, you can find a lot of antagonism. But please, the partnership between Gandhi and Nehru other Congress leaders and Ambedkar that took place in the creation of the Constitution is a historical fact. Is a historical fact. And uh, of course, Gandhi also ultimately openly said he was against caste. To begin with, he said it was against untouchability, but he was cautious about caste. Why? Because he wanted the caste Hindus also in the fight for India's freedom. Gandhi was not only fighting for. Uh, on the, on the social question, he was he wanted India's independence. He wants, wanted Hindus and Muslims to work together. So he had to prioritize each year, each month, each decade of his life. He had to prioritize. But in the end, he became an absolute radical over caste. So Gandhi and Ambedkar are on the same side, if you look at it. When it comes to secularism, when it comes to freedom of speech, when it comes to equality, Gandhi and Ambedkar are together. And in fact, that's a very important question. All the, you know, uh, Arundhati Roy and I have had the disagreements. I've you know, written in the past, uh, responding to some of her uh, attacks on, on Gandhi. But I, I rejoice when uh, Arundhati Roy, in, in such terrific language, she describes what is happening. I feel that she and I are on the same side. Gandhi and Ambedkar are on the same side. Uh, uh, and, and so the idea, yeah, there's a very good question, ideological premise uh, to foresee the rooted, uh, yes, we do need an ideological uh, commonness, but I think let us frame that ideology also in, in language that would, could, could appeal to and could attract virtually everybody. Anybody who opposes domination, opposes coercion, who opposes hierarchy is, is, on, uh, is on our side. And, and I think one very important element of uh, the ideology that could unite all of us. Incidentally, if we spend too, many, too much time on fine tuning the words of our common ideology, that may create more division. Uh, we should, it, it should be very broad. What are we for and what are we against? So we are very much for political leaders being interrogated by journalists. If, if a leader cannot face direct questions, if in parliament questions can't be directly addressed, so that, you know, on, on that there can be absolute ideolo ideological agreement among everybody. That's one element of it. Uh, but that is, uh, my role is not to do that. The, the friends who are asking these good questions should get together and, and formulate it in, in as uh, broad and as uh, attractive a manner for everybody, clear a manner. But I, to, to, so I would say that in addition to finding words for a, a uniting ideo ideology, let us also find, uh, take time to appreciate the little things that happen, the little positive things happen, no matter from which side. Uh, and we can celebrate those, encourage those, and uh, you know, one one word of truth, one word for one gesture of justice, is, a, is does a lot. That's a lot. I mentioned the story of this man, this uh, ambulance driver in, in Delhi, this Arif Khan. And what an amazing example he is of courage, of compassion, of reconciliation, of nation building. He's a hero. But there are many such heroes in all our neighborhoods. Let us identify them. Let us celebrate them.
I think we have uh, reached uh, almost an hour now. Uh, um, would we wind up or you have uh, um, you know, time for a few more questions to be addressed? Professor Dan. No, I, I'm also thinking, but I know I, I appreciate it. I think uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's participation. I'm very glad about this. I extend everyone my good wishes. You, we, don't, we don't know what the future holds, uh, whether the pandemic will allow me to return to India before long. If I can have another visit to Kerala, it will be fantastic for me. But uh, those are very personal matters. But I know uh, I think in this difficult time, apart from finding formula, finding words, passing resolutions, uh, I want this occasion to be one of those where we uh, create bonds between us as human beings, as brothers and sisters, as, as, as partners in, in, a, in a great uh, effort to, to preserve the right values in India, to restore the right values in India. So I think our personal bonds with one another are very important. So I want to end by extending again my good wishes and appreciation to every single person who has joined today. And I thank those who invited me uh, to have this interaction. Um, I'm also grateful uh, to Dr. Dindi Divagaran, Joy Elaman, Matthew Andrews, uh, the organizers of uh, this meeting. Um, and I'm very happy to hear you uh, Rajmohan Gandhi. It's, it's a pleasure. But back to Dibbi Divakar. Sir, Dr. Joy Lapin will offer a photo. Thanks. Respected dignitaries and uh, colleagues and friends, I don't think I need to again talk a, look, talk a lot on the lecture and the moderation of this program, uh, especially. Professor Gandhi actually took us from historical to contemporary aspects and, uh, and very, very, very relevant of the times. While uh, we in Kerala, or for matter, that matter, across the country, are almost in the dark about most of the things happening even within our country, forget about South Asia. So that is the situation we have. In fact, from Kerala side, if I go through the media and all, I don't think we hear anything about other parts of India itself. And that's the situation where we are. And so your lecture has been an eye opener and actually thought provoking also. And it should actually take us forward. That is how it is. So thank you, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi for such a scholarly and uh, informative and inspiring lecture in this evening. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, Institute of Parliamentary Affairs, Kerala and Kerala Institute of Local Administration, uh, we extend our sincere gratitude for being with us today evening. Thank you, sir. Dr. A.K. Ramakrishnan, I was actually very much worried and confused. How will I, I mean, finally conclude this with a lot of thanks? Because that's a large volume of uh, things I have been talked about. And then finally, you saved me, sir. Because your concise and complete summary of the entire lecture in such a few words. I mean, that actually took us for the discussion part. Actually. So it was very easy for us also. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ekir Ramakrishnan, for being with us on behalf of the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and KILA, extend, we, I extend an, uh, our gratitude. And uh, actually, the program was conceived and uh, organized by the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs, especially Dr. Dindi Divagaran. Actually, I should really thank Dr. Dindi for getting us also involved in this whole program. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And this actually will take us forward together for many other such things to yes, come. Sir. That's the need of the hour also. So we need to work together. As, I mean, we also need to be nice, nice to those who are on the same side as Professor Gandhi mentioned. We need to go forward. And uh, along with you, I also need to thank uh, Mr. Matthew Andrews, my colleague, assistant director in Kila, who actually coordinated all this both with Institute and with Institute of Parliamentary Affairs in Kila. Thank you, Matthew. And then this whole IT team we have in Kila has been managing these kinds of programs very well, Mr. Miraj, yeah, under his leadership. So thanks to the 
ITT for this enabling this facilitating this program, and then a wonderful audience or the participants. The, see the, the chat box is filled with so many comments. I mean, which usually don't happen in many many webinars like this, and it has also been very scholarly in that way. Actually, that also, especially the final moments of this program actually uh, were dependent on how the questions would have come. And thank you participants for being with us. Thank you all once again. Thank you.